Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, this is a presentation on COVID and palliative care. Uh, myself, Kath Dr. Kathleen Benton and my colleague. I'm Lucas Hartwolf. Uh, we together are honored to be here and uh, you'll see that we are going to take you through um, the, the clinical dilemmas um, that occur in uh, palliative care and COVID. I myself will focus more on the clinical and principal perspective and you'll see some crossover um, with practice as uh, my colleague Dr. Lucas focuses on policy. So we hope that you enjoy the session and with that I'll begin uh, my portion. I again am Dr. Kathleen Benton and a brief introduction on myself. Um, I am a, a practicing ethicist, so uh, in the trenches of, of healthcare at the bedside uh, with patients um, through for many, many years, for uh, over 13 years, but currently am the CEO of a large hospice organization in the United States. Um, my focus throughout my practice in ethics has been end of life communication. And I find that it is uh, the center of some of the problems that we see during COVID and clinical practice. Um, I've listed a few of my publications uh, simply because the final publication, Finding Dignity at the End of Life, was uh, very serendipitously uh, published during COVID uh, with my colleague, Reverend, Reverend Renzo Pegararo, also from the PAV, for who, who we represent today. Um, you'll see that throughout the presentation, my own presentation, there are notes uh, from the PAV um, on uh, their take on the time of, of in COVID. And I'll just read a, a, a bit of this because it is so true. All humanity is being put to the test. The pervasiveness of this threat calls into question aspects of our way of life that we have been taking for granted. We are living painfully a paradox that we would never have imagined. To survive the, dise the disease, we must isolate ourselves from each other. But if we were ever to learn to live isolated from one another, we would quickly realize how essential for our life is life with others. And it is so true, and you'll see that interwoven in this particular presentation. I'm gonna focus today on two healthcare environments specifically the skilled nursing facility, nursing homes in the United States, and uh, the clinical side at the hospital. Uh, to begin with the skilled nursing home, um, I, I have to mention uh, this is wrought with issues of isolation. We know that the elderly are already a very vulnerable population, uh, simply um, inherently vulnerable uh, based on um, late, late age. But this level of isolation, I argue, has increased that vulnerability. And in oftentimes, anecdotally, what I have seen is it is speeding up the process of disease, particularly in those patients with dementia. Uh, it is also uh, causing mental distress, great mental distress for those who care for and love those uh, that elderly population. Um, I always believe that the case studies are the most telling. Um, and so with that, I, I want to read you a letter that I received. Um, this case study is from a, a spouse, Betty. Um, it is what she experienced when her husband, who was in a long-term care facility, after being taken care of um, by her for 16 years and what she watched. In the Kevin, could I, could I yes. just get in a comment? The small gray box is showing. If you can get rid of that, that's then because it covers a little bit of the slide in the corner. Oh, if let not, me see if I can move it. Yeah, great. Well, <clears throat> no, now it's a big gray box. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, there, how's that? That's excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, Sorry perfect. to interrupt you. OK, that's OK. In the frightening times of COVID-19, Rules have understandably changed for the safety of all. When the nursing home began experiencing COVID-19 cases, my husband was moved into another unit. Naturally, I was always concerned 
with only a hospice nurse being allowed in, but I was assured that he would get the attention that he needed. Due to his Lewy body dementia, Tom, Tom's care was challenging, especially when involuntary actions like trying to get out of bed caused him to fall. I had to remind the staff more than once to replace the, net, the mats next to his bed. Communication is the biggest issue in the new unit. I cannot begin to recall the number of times I called only to find a full voicemail or one not set up. When the receptionist would page staff, no one would answer. Even staff members from hospice were unable to get someone on the phone, and when that happened, a hospice nurse went to the facility to check on Tom. I went to see my husband on April 25th of 2020. Someone rolled him to the double glass doors and parked him. I was told no one was there that day with a cell phone that could call me so that the phone could be held to his ear, enabling him to hear me. He could not hear me. He had no idea I was there. I just stood there in total surprise of how non-responsive Tom was and how insensitive it was for a staff to simply roll him there and leave him. The next morning, April 26, I did get in touch with the unit and asked them to watch him closely as I felt he was slipping away. I also asked her to convey that same message to other staff. She called me to report on Monday he'd stopped eating, drinking, and taking medications, but vitals were good. We sent the hospice out there. I received the same report the next two days. I constantly reminded them that they had offered me the opportunity to be with him at the end of life and I needed to know when. The hospice nurse had FaceTimed me and Tom did seem to know I was there on the phone, slightly moving his lips. I wish they had known more. Finally, on Thursday morning, hospice called to tell me that he had died. Frankly, one must wonder when he died, the night, the night before, the morning, we'll never know. If you pay attention to any part of my letter, it should be this, people die in different ways. There's not a cookie cutter plan. Tom's brain stopped working. I'm not a medical professional, but perhaps this is how Lewy body dementia goes. Not allowing me to be at his side was cruel for me, but mostly for him. I hope you will not wait long to initiate a change. The nursing home should find a way that COVID negative family members can be at the bedside of a loved one during their final hours. Somewhere between safety rules and human compassion, there must be a solution. And so again, as you saw, a caregiver who took care of someone for 16 years was not able to be with him for his, his imminent death. In my own facility, my hospice facility, we allow caregivers in uh, as soon as a patient comes under hospice because prognostication in end of life is one of the most diff difficult parts of science and no one is ever sure exactly when death will occur. But in the nursing homes where patients reside and still receive hospice care, the same visitation restrictions apply. The same is true of the hospitals. So the, the enduring stress that family members uh, go through and the suffering of isolation is absolutely true, very evident in this letter. Different problems are um, surrounding the hospital situation. Um, it is, we still see the same isolation. Patients are not necessarily elder, elderly, but certainly as a result of going through the system um, and the, the COVID response, they are arguably very vulnerable. So what does that look like? When a family brings a patient to the hospital with COVID, much of the time, even if they have uh, end-stage COPD uh, conge uh, or congestive heart failure, if they have diabetes and obesity, these are very independent people. These are not people who reside in a nursing home. They may be someone who's just cooked the entire family dinner the night before. The families are having to drop off their loved ones experiencing very um, critical COVID symptoms without any optics on the patient demise. And 
what occurs then is that the last time they see that patient, they look well. And even though they know they have this uh, flu-like virus, which we, we all know by now, it is much more dangerous than the flu. But again, that is the optics that they see. Um, the last picture in their mind is of independence and wellness that that person who cooked the dinner or, or or was sewing or was up and and walking the dog and then they get a call from the hospital unable to uh, be a part of their demise or to watch the digression of disease this is so unnatural for families uh, even in times of tragedy, when someone has a car accident or a horrific disease quickly overtakes um, a, a loved one, a family is able, able to view the progression of that disease, even if it is very rapid. In these situations, they are not able to watch this rapid disease take, take hold of the patient. And thus, when the, the uh, physician calls potentially to state that palliative care has been called in and there may be a discussion of goals of care, there is a dwindling trust uh, for the family, a, a difficulty believing that the patient is actually this sick um, and has worsened to end of life. Uh, what we are seeing, and, and I am over a, a large community-based palliative um, staff uh, staff um, and provider practice is that most of the COVID patients, when they get to a point of almost critical, the palliative care team is called in despite the outcome, simply because the outcome is so unknown right now. They know that uh, they could turn a corner positively or negatively very quickly. And the palliative care team is there, therefore able to witness this distrust from the family. Um, the providers are already very uncomfortable having end-of-life discussions. We know this to be true, particularly in the United States. Um, as I stated in my first slide, it has been uh, much of my life's work to research uh, the skill of communication and the difficulties surrounding end-of-life communication uh, that clinicians experience. So you can imagine having an end-of-life discussion um, with someone or a family who's not able to push those prognostic questions. Doctor, what do you think? Do you think he's going to make it? Um, they're not asking because they're not laying eyes on the patient. So thus, the other specialists involved are really not getting involved in these discussions and palliative care is being brought in for almost every COVID patient. Right now, I believe we have um, a census of 50 at our the hospitals we're at and 70% of those are COVID patients. Healthcare, as we know, in, at least in the United States, but I believe throughout um, globally, has become far too complex for treatment to uh, be initiated or continue without an advocate. Yes, you have a nurse at the bedside. Yes, you have specialists in and out but it becomes difficult to ensure there is a gatekeeper for all of that information to be cumulatively put together. And you oftentimes rely on the family if the patient is unconscious or medic heavily medicated uh, to, to be able to put the pieces together and say to the team, yes, the nephrologist came in, they told me we may or may not start dialysis or on and on such as that. There is no advocate here right now. Um, the other big issue is that, um, and this may some, be something that someone never suspects, uh, the staff at the hospital, especially a bedside nurse, a social worker, oftentimes becomes the patient's advocate or at least ally if family can't often visit um, and intermittently. That has also been removed because staff is in such high level PPE. So the art of conversation, as we know, uh, well over 50%, close to 80% of communication is in body language. The body language is lost. <clears throat> Those understanding eyes, the smiles, the hugs, the hand holding, the comforting um, has been removed by this large barrier of PPE. And so um, being able to connect with patients and patients feeling like a certain nurse or a social worker is their ally, that has been lost at this point. 
we are seeing great PTSD um, with true post-traumatic stress for caregivers, professional caregivers. There's compassion fatigue because they are seeing so much of this and there's the inability to connect, as I said before. Um, we're already a sterile healthcare world. We have been for a long time. It has increased that level of, of sterility. Um, the inability to relate and uh, again, the lost rapport, the lost continuity um, and the, the watching the isolated deaths is, is gravely traumatic for those professional caregivers who try to FaceTime <clears throat> but become very frustrated with uh, trying to use technology. Um, as we all know, because we've all been using technology, it's dependable part of the time. And so um, there's no guaranteed good communication just because FaceTime is allowed. Caregivers and families, I read the letter from the wife, Betty, um, but it extends beyond uh, what she mentioned. Um, there's not oftentimes not family meetings to discuss issues, so the whole family may not be on, on board with a withdrawal uh, because <clears throat> cousin from t out of town has been left out. Not everyone can come to the hospital or maybe no one can. Uh, loved ones are scared to be present because their temperature is taken at the entrance and, and even if they're allowed in uh, for an end of life, they may not feel comfortable being there. They're removed. They, they lack the ritualistic grief activities to process the death, the funerals. Um, I myself, um, I was fortunate enough and blessed enough to have a brother who I lived with my whole life who had the same disease as the elephant man. He had 110 surgeries and truly lived a chronically ill life. He passed away before COVID uh, 2017. And I can tell you as a grief stri stricken sister, the support, the outpouring of love, the people who came with meals and to socialize was really important to my grief healing. That's not happening right now, especially if there's a COVID exposure. Those family members are not even a part of the grief process. Um, I, my own, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would be remiss if I failed to mention because I know there is such grief mental health issues throughout the world that my own organization that is, is fully funded by community um, is putting on a virtual memorial service. And I only mention this because this is what we're trying to do throughout the community uh, nationally and globally to help people um, deal with grief and uh, even make a virtual memorial, light a candle in their honor, uh, put their picture on a screen, that ritualistic need for closure so you can begin the grieving process is absolutely key to the healing. And so uh, we as an organization have, have, have really dug deep and gotten creative, just like the rest of the world is all forced to do right now. We're thinking outside the box every day. Um, to find ways to support grief virtually and try to uh, help um, those those patients uh, or those uh, patients loved ones find meaning in the loss, purpose in the lost and be able to walk through their loss. We've taken care of so many COVID patients and I can tell you um, their loved ones, many of them tell need to tell their story again and again. Uh, just so that it, it has some meaning and purpose because it seems all for naught that a well person or a, uh, what they felt like was a well person with many, many years of life left died very quickly. Um, to wrap it all up, it really circling to the principles of ethics, the autonomy is lost when you're in a hospital and you feel there's not, there's not even the choice to say, I want to see my spouse, I want to see my loved one, I want to understand my disease. I want to get to know my nurse. Best interest is is um, is on the edge. Um, at times, the palliative care team has try has a troubling time tr treating symptom management because even though we know the patient is likely going to pass, because we don't know the disease well enough, there is continued aggressive support and we can't seem to adjust those controlled substances in a way um, that helps the shortness of breath or the anxiety in a way that we would normally do because we're still wondering is the patient going to pass at this disease this unknown this enigma 
or not. There's just not enough to know to to be definitive ever in these um, in the prognostics. And just the justice and the suffering end of life. This is a new level of suffering. Isolation is truly a new level of defined suffering. So, um, you know, this is a tough time for the the whole world. And I, I thank you for allowing me to give some examples of the human condition, what we are seeing in clinical practice um, in hospice and palliative care and ethically. And I turn it over to my colleague um, for him to share his wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Thank Kathleen. You. There have been two questions. There have been two questions from the audience. One is um, whether there, are, uh, what are the most innovative solutions that were used to help palliative care patients connect with their loved ones in quarantine during the pandemic? So maybe we should take these two. This and the other one is on: Did we lose more patients earlier than we should have due to understepping and negligence um, in the pandemic? So maybe we. You, yeah. you could answer these two questions immediately. OK, and then I'll absolutely. Um, so I'll address the innovative solutions um, first. I have to um, <clears throat> we have being a nonprofit hospice. We have, for example, a music therapist. Um, we have even gone so far as to go to the window of patients at uh, skilled nursing facilities and um, sing their favorite song, bring their families with us. Uh, the families will set out chair, set up chairs outside the window, and it may mean talking to them still on the phone if we can't open the window, um, but at least there's that ability to connect. Um, every, we, I already mentioned the FaceTime, though. I don't feel that that is a true solution because there's, there's really not that human presence. Um, and like I said, I believe it is what I have done in my own facility, the, the facility I have uh, charge of, is to um, to limit contact, but to still allow loved ones at the bedside. That when someone is in need of, of, of palliative, palliative care, we have learned the importance of masks and PPE, and we can do the same for loved ones who they already know. So I, you know, limiting that and, and uh, strict guidelines to me is the solution. We can't, we can't, we can't do the isolation. Um, <clears throat> I, I, question number two, I don't think I can speak intelligently um, about the understaffing and negligence um, because I, you know, I'm not in the hospital setting. And, um, you know, so everything I would say would be truly anecdotal. I, I can only say that I feel that anyone in a hospital setting did the best they could. And I think um, when you do the best you can, it is not always enough. But it, this was, we all know, something very unknown and something we were very ill prepared for. And I don't know if you have comments on either of those, Lucas. Yeah, I think for the last one, we have to admit that it's been a steep learning curve, especially in the first months of the pandemic. And I think probably much could have been done differently, but probably in most cases by hindsight. Yes. Um, and I'm probably going to. Ed, or I would just like to confirm that everything you said, I probably would sign as well and um, may be able to add on a little bit um, later on. Sorry, got to check for the, yeah. So I'm going to pick up there um, and talk about the public health perspective. Um, I, I'm, I'm really impressed by what Kathleen told us about their experiences in the US and what they concluded from that. Um, and just have to say that this probably is echoed throughout the world in the developed as well as in the um, developing countries. Uh, my name is Lukas Radbuch. I'm a physician and a specialist in palliative care, working in Germany and Bonn, and also I'm chairing the board of directors of the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. I'm, and I'm really happy that I got the opportunity um, to talk a little bit about this issue here with the audience. Um, if you talk about public health perspectives, I think one of the first questions always is, what do you have to do for whom? And for whom, definitely, I think we have to um, clarify that there are, wait a second, got to go into the presentation mode first. Uh, got to clarify that um, there are actually three groups of patients that might require palliative care at some stage. One is that 
especially at the outset of the uh, epidemic, but also right now in the second wave, there is the discussion again about not having adequate resources, not having enough intensive care or ventilatory support available, and that you have to triage who is going to be on intensive care on ventilatory support and who isn't. And that is even happening in high income countries and much more, we are afraid, will happen in developing countries. Um, I think in some of them, we have still low numbers of infection, low numbers of deaths, low numbers of hospitalization, but maybe only because the reporting is not good enough. And we do know from countries such as India um, that they already are nearly overwhelmed in their healthcare system and that the triage issue will be really very prominent. For the patients who are not able to access intensive care, you would the, the very least you have to do is relieve symptoms and sort of um, take care that they're not suffering too much. Uh, there may be patients who do not want to go on intensive care. So in our German setting, for example, if there is a patient, um, high old age um, comorbidities who already has decided in an advanced directive that he doesn't want to go to hospital at all for any complication of anything that he already got, then quite often he will say that this also should be true for the case of COVID-19. I'd rather stay here and get good symptom relief um, and not go to the hospital and die there alone. And there are quite a number of patients who do not or not yet require intensive care and thus will need uh, symptom relief, um, relief of breath, breathlessness, uh, relief of pain, of other symptoms, um, and they have to be cared for. And the, the what question, what can palliative care contribute? Because I think the discussion is focused so much on do we have enough ventilators and do we have enough intensive care beds? Um, but for the decision making in the potential triage setting, I think this is one issue where palliative care can help. Uh, we do have um, a lot of experience in palliative care um, discussing ethical decision making, discussing discussing person-centered care. Um, and I think uh, one of the issues we raised in a commentary um, commentary in The Lancet was that actually what happens in this triage discussion is that the person-centered care that we usually are advocating in modern medicine um, has been replaced in, with an utilitarian thinking and that we have to take great care. This is not carried too far. For example, the discussion on should there be an age limit for intensive care access? And clearly the answer should be that age alone should not be a factor in triage decisions. Uh, I'm not saying that palliative care should be the, um, the, the specialty doing the triage, but the contribution of palliative care expertise um, in this kind of resource allocation could be really helpful. As I said, for patients who are not on intensive care, and but even for those who are in ventilatory support, they would need symptom control and access to opioids. Um, and we have to realize that COVID-19 really produces a huge uh, serious health related suffering burden on patients and sometimes also on the next of kin. And there is the issue of social isolation and suffering, which uh, Kathleen explained so well with the examples, uh, not being able to say goodbye, not being able to have the traditional griefing rituals, memorial services, or even a proper funeral um, does cause a lot of suffering also in the families. Um, for palliative care, we are always fighting uh, with the idea that palliative care is for cancer only. Um, this is historically um, sort of from the um, Western European, North American countries that there had been a focus on cancer. Right now I'm teaching in the master's course on global health and the palliative care bit has been put in the non-communicable disease area. And then I have to explain to the participants that actually um, palliative care has its major um, initiation, at least in African, Latin American and Asian countries related to the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, because at that initial stages, at least, it was clear that a lot of people are going to suffer and die and that they would need at least palliative care if they can't be cured or life could not be prolonged. Now, HIV um, has not been that prominent with the um, ART treatment, but multi-resistant tuberculosis has emerged as a new 
um, infectious disease, which needs palliative care in a few thousands of patients per year. And there have been also disc discussions on Ebola and rabies being indications for palliative care as the, they cause symptoms and symptoms can be alleviated by um, palliative care. Um, in general, for humanitarian emergencies, even the WHO by now has produced guidance on the integration of palliative care and symptom relief in the response to humanitarian emergencies and crisis. And for major pandemics, I think a lot of good advice and guidance is to be found there. Especially the Ebola epidemic um, a few years ago in Western Africa, um, there have been, um, has been some research done on that. And Felicia Naul has published um, that um, as, as one of the issues in the Lancet report on um, the excess abyss on palliative care and pain relief. Um, this is just an excerpt from the publication saying that palliative care focused on management of symptoms such as nausea and vomiting improves patient comfort, but also maintains patient fluid volume and thus improves chances of survival. But opioids typically were only available in small amounts. There was at that stage one hospice program in Sierra Leone, which was overwhelmed by the need. And the palliative care specialists, the few that there were, were quite important in the management of the pandemic, uh, but far too few by and large. And the non-pharmacological needs um, were the same as now and were vastly underreported and were probably much more important than has been acknowledged. Uh, there, there were also some good ideas, uh, some innovative ideas in there, which um, initially at the first wave of the pandemic, of the COVID pandemic, I thought we might have to discuss, for example, um, with Ebola, once you're through the infection, you are immune. So they had actually trained survivors as volunteers to care for other patients. Um, but for COVID-19, that would not be an issue because you are not really, still not really sure about how long immunity will keep and how good it will be. Uh, so we couldn't translate that. And I think this also gives a good indication that the response to pandemics has to be tailored according to the specific factors of this disease and can't be generalized. Um, all this is happening on the background of already a vast um, opioid crisis, a vast crisis in access to palliative care throughout the world. This is again from the Lancet report, um, headlined by Felicia Nau. Um, and you see here a global map, but the countries are not the geographical size, but rather the size of their opioid usage. And this means that Australia, Western Europe and North America are using opioids quite generously and actually 95% of the distribu distributed morphine equivalent is used up for 9% of the global population. And using this kind of representation, Africa, Asia and South America are not visible at all in the landscape. And this sort of shows how vast the um, problems already are in accessing opioids um, in resource poor settings. And this is accelerated really by a lot uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic, because now you probably would need much more essential medicines such as opioids, because you have now increased need with patient groups with COVID-19, the ones, actually the ones on intensive care, because they also need opioids for analgesia, even during ventilatory support. And um, we even in high income country, even in Germany and the UK and in some other countries, um, there was at least for a short period of time, there were problems in accessing opioids because countries were scaling up their intensive care resources and each new bed required um, stocking with opioids as well. Um, and one of the companies producing opioids for intensive care actually was in Italy in one of the lockdown areas and couldn't deliver. Uh, so even here in Germany, we were advised that there might be some problems for the next weeks, at least until this can be overcome. Um, there is competition with the palliative care patients that we already treat and cancer patients, HIV patients, other patients requiring palliative care may be squeezed out of the system because all the opioids available in some countries will go to the COVID patients. 
Um, there are options to import opioids with simplified procedures by the International Narcotic Control Board, more on that later. But even if you would have more opioids in the country, there would, in most countries there would be a huge lack of healthcare staff that is trained in the use of these opioids. Especially if you talk about the public health approach, we desperately need more training of primary health, uh, care health staff in order to disseminate and prescribe and use the opioids properly. Um, this has already been explained by Kathleen um, in, in detail. Um, I think the social um, sequelae from the um, suffering that we had during the lockdown, but also um, during later stages and now with the lockdowns on the second wave again, with social distancing and quarantine um, interventions that there were no family members at the bedside, no loved ones visiting. Um, one of the hospitals I work in has again a strict lockdown policy. So if the family members want to bring anything for the patient, um, they have to sort of deliver it to the hospital door, but they are not allowed in, with the only exception of the palliative care unit, where we do have some different rules. Um, we stopped um, all visits from volunteers, from psychosocial caregivers were at least reduced by, by a lot. Um, for example, the chaplains at the university hospital said that they are in a risk, um, high risk group themselves. So they would only do telephone consultations and not visit patients anymore. Um, funeral rites, memorial services were impeded by a lot. Um, I think in late in March, I did the first death certificate in one of our palliative care patients in the pandemic. And I told the, um, the husband that uh, for the burial of his wife, um, just to remind you, no more than 10 people. This was the regulation at that time. And he was definitely shocked because he said, you know, um, we, she was so well known throughout the village. And now I can't even invite the neighbors for the funeral. And this is, you know, this is just a small thing probably for us. But for him, it meant the world that he would not be able to give her a proper farewell. Um, this leads to loneliness, not able to say goodbye, fear of infection risk um, for the loved ones. So even if you allow visits, then the family members who can visit the patient will be afraid that they may cause an infection and the patient himself may be afraid that he might infect them. There are feelings of guilt. There's a huge feeling of stigmatization from patients and family members. Um, and all that has to be dealt with and is currently really underreported and underrecognized. Kathleen has talked about the exemptions for, and, and I think it has to be clear that most of the regulations I know of in, the, in, in nearly all countries would allow exemptions for dying patients. In palliative care, we try to do that. So even though the hospital has a complete lockdown, we allow two visitors per day for the palliative care unit. And if a patient is dying, we would say that, you know, if, if it's more than two, just bring in the family. Don't loiter around on the corridor, go into the room of, with the patient, but that's possible. And when I discussed that in the crisis management team of the hospital, the intensive care guy came up and said, well, actually, um, we could do that in intensive care as well. If we have enough PPE for the family members, they could dress up and come in for a dying patient in intensive care as well. If you want it, you can do it. There is some risk, but risking um, not having the family members at the bedside might cause more harm than the infection risk that you are preventing. The virtual contacts, I agree with Kathleen, this, you can do that, but it's no substitute for the real thing. Um, but you can also, if, if there's nothing else, there are other things you can do. You can um, agree on a time to think about each other like virtual visits. You can agree to pray at the same time um, or pray by, um, by FaceTime or by smartphone apps. Um, you can stay connected by letters, pictures, paintings, music. Um, actually, with the HIV epidemic, there has been a WHO um, intervention in African countries because so many kids lost both parents to the HIV infection. and um, what they did is a shoebox for eternity. So what they did is that um, they collected um, memoria, memoria really, 
uh, for the from the deceased parents, like pictures, like anything related to the parents, put that in a shoebox to give the kid something to think about, something to remember. And you can do something similar on a different scale for patients now dying with COVID and in isolation. And there's always the use of social media, even though that probably is not um, exactly the same thing. We have discussions right now in the second wave, whether we should stop volunteer visits, whether we should stop psychosocial support, um, the, the music therapy, the art therapist. Um, and, um, you know, when we discuss this, I start saying that, you know, um, physicians, nurses are essential and we should stop all the other visits on the unit in order to reduce the number of contacts. Um, but that raised the discussion in my own team, um, whether it's only physicians and nurses that are essential and whether volunteers or psychosocial therapists not also are as essential because the social dimension might be as important as the physical dimension. And so right now we're in two minds and we would allow, um, at least in selected cases, also volunteers or volunteer coordinators and humor or art therapists on our unit. Um, Got to rush up here and um, just remind you that there is a lot of recommendations out there. Uh, this one is from the Pontifical Academy of Life, the White Book on Global Palliative Care Advocacy, saying that in general, palliative care has to be implemented and integrated in healthcare. This, these are the three recommendations for policymakers from the White Book, uh, saying that policymakers must recognize the value of palliative care. They must ensure that universal palliative care access is provided, and they must ensure that palliative care training is available for those who treat patients with chronic progressive diseases. And I would add to that from the public health perspective, actually they must ensure universal palliative care training for all primary caregivers. And this is even more important in times of the pandemic. Let me remind you that the World Health Assembly in the resolution 73.1 has included palliative care in the COVID-19 response. This is the, um, top uh, the section 7.7, .7, um, which urges national governments to provide access to safe testing, treatment and palliative care. And more detailed, detailed guidance can be found, for example, on opioid access um, by the joint statement from the International Narcotic Control Board, WHO and the UN OCD, ODC office, um, where they again explain that there are simplified measures to import opioids in cases of emergency. Um, that, um, but even then, you still would have to ensure that adequate training of healthcare staff is available, um, and you should stock up opioids um, better now than late, because once you got the emergency, it may be too late. Um, with that, to conclude, I think. If that is done, we have uh, we have to make clear that palliative care is essential, and that's true as well as on the left side in a high developed country like Germany, or in a low resource setting. This is from Joburg in South Africa, a patient in one of the townships um, treated for cancer, not for COVID. But then again, all patients that need it should be able to access palliative care throughout the pandemic, whether they suffer from COVID-19 or other diseases and uh, the health access is endangered right now. And Lucas, I, I know I'm sorry to interrupt. I know you're on just about your last slide. I just wanted you to know there's a couple yeah. of questions on the right hand side. <clears throat> um, and you may want to look through yeah. them. I'm, I'm going to just say two things um, that I felt like um, make a difference. We could in reference to preparing better for palliative care, I want to make the point that conversations can never come too early. We've always abandoned these conversations until the very end. And if if not now, then there's never a better time than to bring these conversations about goals of care and boundaries earlier into patient care so that you can begin palliation earlier if they don't want aggressive treatment. And I believe spiritual support should be case by case and we should make allowances using PPE for spiritual ritual at the end of life. I don't know if there's others you want to add to in the last minute if you've had a chance. Um, to look. Yeah, yeah, one thing is the question on how ensure that uh, palliative care treatment is not impeded. And I think it's very important that palliative care expertise is included in the crisis management teams on a 
local level in the hospital, but also on a regional and on a national level. So in Germany right now, um, we are doing a pandemic planning for the integration of palliative care, and that's going to be part of the national pandemic response. Things like that are important. Yes. Um, Will you I turn think, your camera on, Lucas? I'm sorry. I camera. Turned, it, turned itself out. Yeah. Um, they, the, there, yeah the hospital, there you are. If there's still time, the spiritual needs, um, I think that's just an issue, recognizing that spiritual needs are as important as physical needs, and just acknowledging that, and then discussing um, how spiritual caregivers can access the patients. And sometimes that may be virtual, but in many cases, I think it can be done in person. Grateful. It's been a it's been a joy to speak with you, and I feel that we've covered as much as we can in forty five minutes. So thank you yeah. all. Can just return the compliment. Thanks to everybody, and thanks, Kathleen, for talking so well.